service with the hymn in your spiral gospel hymns, hymn book number 42. 42. Let us praise the name of Jesus. Let's all stand together. open our Bibles together to Psalm 8. Psalm 8. <clears throat> A Psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and suckling hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, and thou that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beast of the field, the fowls of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the pass of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name. In all the earth. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we know that the heavens declare your glory. And yet we confess to you, Lord, that we we walk through this creation of yours and and so oftentimes fail to to acknowledge your handiwork and to offer you to the praise that, that you're worthy of. Lord, we pray that in this hour, 
that you would enable us to set our affections on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Lord, that you would enable us to worship you in the power of your spirit and according to the truth of your word. Pray that you would cause Christ to be lifted up in our hearts. Lord, that we'd be brought into thy presence in a spirit of worship and praise. Oh, we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Number 340 in the hardback hymnal. 340. Nearer, still nearer. Let's all stand once again. <clears throat> Psalm 7. Would you turn with me there, please, in your Bible? Psalm 7. 
how glorious it is to see these psalms as the prayers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here in Psalm 7, we have words spoken by King David as he's fleeing his enemies and he's speaking them prophetically again about the Lord Jesus Christ, pleading his innocence with the Father. Now, you say, well, now wait a minute. Psalm 6, the Lord was owning our sins as his and expressing his sorrow for his sin. Um, and now in Psalm 7, he's pleading his innocence. Which is it? Which is it? It's both. It's both. The gospel is full of paradoxes. A paradox is an apparent contradiction, which is not a contradiction at all. Um, the Lord Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. How can that be? <laughs> well, it's a paradox, isn't it? Um, the child of God is fully sinful and perfectly holy at the same time. How can that be? It's a paradox, isn't it? The scriptures are full of paradoxes. Um, God is absolutely sovereign, and yet man is held responsible before God for his own sin. That's a paradox. Now, a contradiction would be that God is sovereign and man has a free will. That cannot be made sense of, but a paradox, it is that God is sovereign and man is responsible. So well, how do we know these paradoxes are true? Because the scriptures declares them to be true. When God gives you faith to believe, you just believe everything God says. And if he says it, then it's true. And in Psalm 6, it's clear that the Lord is owning the sins of his people as his own and expressing his sorrow before the Father. And in Psalm 7, it is clear that he is pleading his innocence before the Father. Notice in the title of this psalm, Shigeon of David, and we don't know what that word means. Most people have concluded that it just means a song. It's the only place in the scripture where this word's used. But it's a song of David, which he sang unto the Lord concerning the words or the business or the activity of Cush the Benjamite. Now, in 1 Samuel chapter 9, Saul, who the people make, God chooses him to be the first king of Israel. And um, Saul is called the son of Kish, the Benjamite. So this clearly is a song that David wrote as he is pleading his innocence to God over the accusations that Saul is making against him as Saul pursues him to kill him out of, out of um, envy. You remember the people sang after David killed Goliath, the people sang Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And so there was a, there was a deep jealousy in the heart of Saul towards David and, and that jealousy motivated him to, uh, to try to kill David. And, uh, and, da and David is saying, I, Lord, I'm not, I'm not guilty of these charges that he's making. Now, all of that having been said, the Lord Jesus Christ has an enemy. And uh, you and I have an enemy. And he's called the accuser of the brethren. He makes charges against us and would intimidate us with his lies if we didn't have one pleading our cause before God and presenting our 
innocency before the Father. And that's what this psalm is all about. It's such, a, such an encouragement. Before we read the psalm, turn with me to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And this will put the, the words of this psalm in their proper context as they relate to the son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ, pleading his cause to the Father. In Psalm 8, we begin reading in verse 32, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? <laughs> Men are in bondage, and they don't know it. Look what the Lord said in the next verse. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever commit a sin is a servant of sin. What do you mean you're free? You're not free. Paul makes that clear in Romans chapter 7 when he says that uh, uh, we know that the law is holy, but I am sold under sin. And there we have those two natures. And the Lord's making it clear here that those who sin are a slave to sin. Now what did I come to do? And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. This matter of sin's got to be dealt with. Sin's got to be put away. The enemy's got to be destroyed. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ came to do. He said when the comforter comes, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me. That's the root of all of our problems, unbelief. Of righteousness because I go to the Father. We have a righteous advocate before God, a sinless substitute standing in our stead before God and of judgment because the prince of this world has been judged. Now that's what Psalm 7 is all about. We're going to see that in a moment. But uh, it's the Lord Jesus Christ presenting himself on behalf of his people before the Father as innocent and righteous, putting away this matter of sin so that, so that we're no longer a slave to sin. Verse 37, I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. Now this is not true of those who have been set free. The Lord said, if, if the Son make you free, you're free indeed. And if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And now the Lord's speaking to those who have no regard for his word. And he said, you're not, you're not free because you, you don't believe me. My word has no place in you. I speak that which I have seen from my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. What was the work of Abraham? He believed God. He believed God. Without faith, it is impossible, impossible to please God. For they that cometh to him must believe that he is, and he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. What God gives his people in regeneration is faith. Faith. They believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for all their righteousness before God. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. <clears throat> I want to say to people who act religious that uh, they don't know your God. You don't know my God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceed forth and come from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. 
Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you can not hear my word, you are of your father, the devil. He's the one that I came to defeat. <laughs> He's the one that I came to deliver my people from. They were slaves to sin. They were in bondage. They could not believe. And I came to destroy the works of the devil. That's what I came to do. You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinces me of sin? I'm innocent before God. You can't, you can't charge me of sin. What did they accuse him of? Blasphemy. Blasphemy. And David's going to say in Psalm 7, if the charges that Saul is making against me are true, then God judge me for it. But they're not true. They're not true. And the charges they made against our Lord were not true. Because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinces me to sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. You therefore hear them not because you are not of God. You say that I'm of the devil. That's what they accused him of. Look at verse 48. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? And Jesus answered, I am not a devil, but I honor my father, and you do dishonor me. Why do you dishonor me? Because you don't believe me. You don't believe me. I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my sayings, he shall never see death. A man believes my word, believes me and who I am. I'm the innocent one. <laughs> I'm the one who must present himself on your behalf in order for you to have acceptance with God. Now, turn to me to uh, John chapter 12, verse 27. This was after the Lord brought Lazarus out of the grave. And he said, now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered and others said an angel spake unto him. And Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sake. Now, we look at verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. What I came to do, I came to destroy the works of the devil. I came to set my people free. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Now turn with me to 1 John chapter 3. We're going to get to our text in a moment. And I want you to see how... This song of David is the words of Christ, pleading his innocence before God on behalf of his people. And we know that every prayer that he prayed, just as he said here in John chapter 12, Father, I, I, I didn't say this for, for my sake, but for their sake, <laughs> for their sake. Um, and it's for our sake. Notice in John, 1 John chapter 3 at verse 8. 
He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Did the Lord Jesus Christ destroy the works of the devil? Yes. Yes. He put away the sins of his people and made them innocent in himself before God. So that whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin for he is born of God. (laughs) So those that are in Christ have been delivered by the death of Christ from this slavery of sin to, to know the truth of who they are in Christ and to be made free. Now, turn to me back to our text. John chapter 16, verse 11. For judgment came I into the world that the prince of this world might be judged. Now Saul in this story with David represents Satan. That's who the Lord came to destroy. That's who he came to deliver his people from. And he was successful in doing it. And now David says, look at verse 1. O Lord my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. The Lord Jesus Christ praying to the Father to deliver him from his enemy. Lest he tear my soul like a lion. And Satan is like a roaring lion, isn't he? Seeking whom he may devour. And just like Daniel was put into that lion's den, you and I live in a lion's den, don't we? But the lion's mouth's been shut. He has no power. He's been defeated. And God's people join in with their Lord in saying, Oh Lord my God, save me, deliver me, shut the lion's mouth. How am I going to be delivered? Look at verse 3. O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there be iniquity in my hands, if I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, Lord, this this problem of sin is not my fault. I restored that which I took not away. (laughs) This This is man's responsibility. This is... This is, the, this is the work of Satan that came into the garden and drew, drew man in rebellion against God. And the Lord says, if, there's, if, there, if these charges that they're making against me are true, if, there, if you find any iniquity in me, let the enemy persecute my soul and take it, verse 5. Let him tread down my life upon the earth and lay my honor in the dust. (laughs) If I'm I'm guilty of these charges that are being made against me, then I bear the responsibility of judgment. But I'm not. I'm not. I'm not guilty. Look, arise, O Lord, in thine anger. Lift up thyself because of the rage of my enemies and awake for me to the judgment that thou hast commanded. Lord, you commanded judgment. You commanded that the work that I would do on Calvary's cross would be successful in destroying the works of the devil, in setting my people free, in putting away their sin. And now I'm calling on you to exercise that judgment. So shall the congregation of the people compass thee about, 
For their sakes, therefore, return thou on high. <laughs> Lord, this is uh, the innocency of the Lord Jesus Christ is the cause of our hope of salvation. We, we, we're able to stand in the very presence of God. God made him who knew no sin to be sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So here our Lord now is saying the church, the congregation of the people are going are gonna to gather together around us in glory. For their sakes therefore return thou on high. And what did the Lord say? I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. In my Father's house are many mansions. <laughs> if it were not so, I would have told you. So here's, here's our Lord interceding on behalf of his church, saying, Father, I'm coming. I'm going to be seated at the right hand of the majesty on high and the people are going to be gathered together. The Lord shall judge the people. Verse 8, judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to mine integrity that is in me. Now who can go before God? Job tried it, didn't he? <laughs> Job over and over again tried to justify himself before God and pleaded with God to judge him according to his righteousness. Job in the end is glad that the Lord didn't do that. But the Lord Jesus Christ can go before the Father and say, judge me according to my righteousness. If there be any guilt in me, I'll bear the blame. But I'm presenting myself on behalf of my people as innocent integrity is in me you and I come before the throne of grace we come in the Lord Jesus Christ and this righteousness and integrity that he has gives us access doesn't it so that we can come boldly we can come with confidence knowing that we have a righteousness before God. Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just, for the righteous God trieth the hearts and reigns. Man looks at the outward appearance, and you and I look at the outward appearance of our lives, don't we? And we think, oh, Lord, I'm in trouble. But aren't you glad, brethren, that God looks at the heart? Not that your heart is pure and perfect. The heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? But if God gives you faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's in your heart. That's in your heart. You know if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> and more importantly, he knows <laughs> if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's giving you that faith. And so he's, he's looking at the one to whom we trust in faith. And the believer says, my defense is of God which saveth the upright in heart. <laughs> the Lord has taken out the heart of stone. He's put in a heart of flesh. He's given us life in Christ. We have the mind of Christ. We have faith in Christ. We have believe on the Lord. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, he says he saves the upright in heart. God judgeth the righteous God is angry with the wicked every day. There's two kinds of people in this world. Those that are in Christ and those that aren't. Those that are, that are righteous before God, those who are 
innocent before God. Those who have their sins put away for time and eternity and those who don't. That's it. There's no in between. There's no gray area. The Lord Jesus Christ now is presenting himself and the child of God says, yes, that's what that that's who I need. <laughs> that's who I'm trusting. That's he's the one I'm hoping in. Bert and I were talking before the service, this uh, billboard out here on, on the interstate. One, great big letters declaring to the whole world, God is not angry. <laughs> and I said, yeah, well, that fits their view of God. God how, how could God be angry when he loves everybody? He's angry with the wicked every day, all day, every day. In verse 12, if he turn not, if the wicked don't come to Christ, he will wet his sword. He hath bent his bow and made it ready. He hath also prepared for him the instruments of death. He ordereth his arrows against the persecutors. The judgment of God's real. The wicked don't believe it. They have no fear of God. You know, I've, I've made this statement a couple times recently that to fear God is to believe God. But I, it might even be more helpful to understand it like this. To fear God is to fear standing in his presence without an advocate, without a savior. You see, the natural, the wicked aren't, don't, don't fear. The wicked think that I'm just going to bust into the presence of God and I'm just going to present myself and, and everything's going to be okay. Because God's not angry. We know that God is a holy God. And, and if, we don't, if, if the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't stand in our stead before God, we're, we fear the wrath of God. He will wet his sword. He has bent his bow. He's made it ready. He's prepared him instruments of death. He ordaineth his arrows against the persecutors. Now the persecutors are described in verses 14 and 15. Behold, he travaileth with iniquity and hath conceived mischief and brought forth falsehoods. <laughs> he travails. He, that word means he works. He works his works of iniquity in hopes that he'll be able to present something before God. That's what the Lord said when he separates the sheep from the goats. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. But the wicked are travailing in iniquity. They're travailing in their good works in hopes that they're somehow going to earn them favor with God. They're not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ for their righteousness. They're presenting themselves. He travails in his iniquity. And he's conceived. <laughs> he loves the God of his imagination. We, we, we just, by nature, we're all a bunch of idol factories. And it gets going really early in life where we begin to imagine a God that's all together as we are ourselves. And then we begin to bargain with that God as if we would bargain with a man. And that's what the Lord's saying. This wicked man, he travails, he works his iniquity. He, he conceives mischief. He brings forth falsehoods. <laughs> he believes the lie. He believes that, his, that, that he's got a free will. He believes that, that, that his works are are acceptable before God. 
He's made a pit. He's dicked it. And he falls into the ditch which he made. Isn't that what the Lord said? They are blind guides leading the blind. They're all going to fall into the ditch. Leave them alone. Get away from them. Don't have anything to do with them. His mischief shall return upon his own head and his violent dealings shall come down upon his pate. Now that's just a word that means crown, the crown of his head. His, his works. And what the Lord says here is that the sword, the sword is a picture of words, isn't it? The sword of God's justice when the Lord comes He's going to have a tongue like a flaming sword speaking his word and bringing judgment. And what did the Lord say? By your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. What you say about Christ, what you say you believe, who you say you believe. The very you, You've dug a pit with your own words and your own words are going to fall upon your own head. God's going to judge men by their words. What say ye of Christ? <laughs> Whose son is he? Is his righteousness all your righteousness before God? Is your innocency and your righteousness before God completely in him? If so, verse 17, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. <laughs> I'm going to rejoice in him. Rejoice in him always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known unto all men. Why? The Lord is at hand. The Lord's near. The Lord Jesus Christ, like David, pleads his innocence and his righteousness before God on behalf of his people. And he's saying to the Father, if I'm guilty of what they say I'm guilty of, judge me for it but I'm not. I'm not. Yes, he bore our sins in his body upon the tree and owned them as his own and felt the full shame of them as we saw last week in Psalm 6. God saw the travail of his soul and God was satisfied. And at the very same time, the glorious paradox of the gospel is that he was completely innocent before God. And pleads his innocent and presents his righteousness before the Father. And the Father was pleased. Pleased to save him and save all those who he came to deliver from the, from the pit of hell. That's what the scripture says. He said he came to set captivity captive. We come into this world captive to Satan. Unable to believe. Unable to believe, unable to see, unable to come. And the Lord Jesus Christ, because he destroyed his enemy, he destroyed the works of the devil, and he set his people free. And he put our sins away. And we have an innocence and a righteousness before God in Christ. We've got an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. We've got a high priest who has entered into the heavens, you saw that in verse, in, in verse um, um, 7. The congregation of the people come pass about thee. For their sakes, therefore, return thou on high. The Lord Jesus Christ returned back to his rightful place at the right hand of the majesty on high. And he ever lives to make intercession for us perfectly righteous 
sinless and innocent. So that the justice of God was met. Judgment was satisfied. And we can say, we can say, if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we can say, Lord, if, I, if, if I'm not a believer, judge me. <laughs> I'm, I, yeah, I deserve to go to hell. If I'm not in Christ, Christ is my only hope. He's my only hope. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word. And Lord, we thank you that we have a, a righteous advocate, a sinless Savior, one who presents himself on our behalf, one in whom we have acceptance. Lord, we're thankful for these prayers of David and for how we are able by your spirit to see them relating to, to our Savior, thy dear Son. We pray that you would give us faith to believe on him. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Number 474 in the hardback hymnal. Let's stand together. Uh, we've seen this song without no chorus, without singing the chorus, so no chorus. I guess I couldn't find it in the digital hymn book. Yeah. 